to it. Anubia Homan is a PhD candidate at SOAS and a researcher for the Institute of Islamic Strategic Affairs. She'll speak on war in Syria and the Kurdish media narrative. Which one is next? Yeah. Hello. Um, so I'm here to represent uh, WISA, which does research on social and strategic dynamics in the Islamic world. Not necessarily in a religious sense, but uh, sort of geographically. <coughs> um, before I start, I want to say two things. Um, first, I'm really not trying to offend anyone, so if I say something that can be taken in the wrong way, just tell me later on and maybe um, if we put this paper online or something, I will edit it. I'm <coughs> really not trying to do that. And also, I'm sorry for talking with a piece of paper. I much prefer to talk naturally, but I have a lot of statistics and I'm very sure I'm going to say them wrong otherwise. Um, yeah. uh, right, so what I wanted to do was to uh, discuss how um, Northern Kurdistan or Bakur uh, media portray the war in Syria, uh, not just the campaign against IS, but also just the wider civil war and human rights. Um, the problem we were having at the Institute was sort of this outsider looking in problem where we really want to write about this region, but we're not from there. I also, I don't speak Kurdish particularly well, um, so it's hard to get into it properly. Um, but of course, that doesn't mean that we can't do any research or that any research we do doesn't have any value. Um, so what I wanted to do today is just explore a few methods that we tried to acquire information, the problems we encountered, and what kind of results we did achieve. Um, because while Bakr has a unique and valuable perspective of the situation on its borders, there's a notable absence of consist consistent and coherent information from this region, uh, which is accessible <laughs> elsewhere, for example, in the UK. Um, we selected several case studies. Um, mainly in this presentation, I'm going to focus on Kurdish newspapers, online uh, publications. We've also looked into television, blogs, social media, individual interviews. Uh, but much less consistently. And we're going to contrast this a little bit with Western media, British newspapers, German newspapers, um, also online publications, just to keep it consistent. Um, and this is a little bit challenging because it's nearly impossible to access independent and unbiased journalism. Uh, although some studies have been done on Kurdish journalism or backward journalism during the 20th century, uh, the coup cool attempt in July has had a massive impact on media and the region. Um, the effects are not yet completely known. I was reading news about it this morning. Um, and of course, this will be analyzed for many years, but we, <coughs> we hope to create a little bit sort of, of a comprehensive overview of the situation as a basis for further research anyway, to start with. Um, so often questions are pointed in the direction of the Turkish government or the PKK and uh, in Western media and other events receive less attention, uh, whereas the civil war, the Syrian civil war, has been having a very large and sure to have a further very large impact on Kurdish culture and identity. So we wanted to sort of steer into that direction. Um, and the way this conflict is portrayed by the Bible <coughs> Kurdish themselves is a story which we don't really want to see buried underneath internal media problems. Uh, right, so what I really wanted to do today was present on the basis of interviews what people have told me about the story so far. People from this part of Kurdistan, how they see the Syrian civil war and what's been happening. But most of my interviews this week fell through. So actually, <laughs> the main thing I have is the story of uh, the last three months rather than the last five years. Uh, stay tuned, I will fill in this information at some point in the next month or so. But that's what I'll focus on today. Uh, I started with a little bit of history. Um, I'm a historian originally, so what else could I do? Uh, because, I mean, media, it can mean anything. It could be uh, television, online networks, um, and so forth. But as I said, we were focused sort of on newspapers. And those are a good example of sort of censorship in British history in general. Because newspapers, the earliest ones in the UK were founded sometime in the 17th century. like. 1630, 1650. Um, but the first newspaper printed in the Ottoman Empire wasn't released until the mid 19th century. And then the first 
Kurdish, not even newsletters, uh, newspapers, but newsletters, they only turn up at the beginning of the 20th century. Uh, so there's a very large gap in what's available already and what people, the ways in which people can express themselves in this way. And then, of course, most publications ceased during the First World War. Um, then there was no, what did I write, no daily new Kurdish newspaper until the 1958 revolution. Um, in the 1960s and 1970s, there were several legal and underground backward Kurdish groups who attempted to start regular publications, but most of them were suspended or shut down by the Turkish government. And actually the situation is quite similar today, where most newspapers in this region don't survive for more than a decade, and any paper that's trying to set themselves up now kind of faces the same fate. Um, so, I was going to summarize uh, what happened uh, in Turkey in July, but I think everyone here is kind of aware of that. Uh, the result, in either way, was <coughs> that um, over, yeah, over 100 papers were, or over 100 media outlets were already shut down by the end of September, um, mostly because they were allegedly linked to BKK or Gulen. And um, at this point, I think it's over 150. <coughs> Um, which of course drastically changes the backward Kurdish media landscape just in the last three months. Um, I was also going to give an overview of all Kurdish political parties um, and all the media that we found that people sort of regularly access or read or are still accessible or used to be but are no longer but I don't really want to just read a whole list of stuff so if someone is interested in it I can share it with you later. Um, I just kind of want to move on to our actual, where our actual analysis starts. So um, people we interviewed for this, they said that uh, Kurdish media have always been more or less party affiliated, <coughs> they've been involved in a uh, quote, battle for political and ideological control in general. Uh, media may propagate conspiracy theories, particularly in relation to Turkey and whether it is involved in supporting IS. Uh, since the siege in Kobani, Kur Kurdish media and Turkish media have differed drastically in their portrayal of war. In particular, Kurdish media have pushed the narrative that Kobani was a heroic struggle for the Kurdish people and that Turkey is aiding IS. Um, but much of such content is blocked on Turkish internet connections and the Turkish government removes content it disapproves of. In addition, inside Bakur, it is difficult to find information because a lot of people feel like they could be monitored and potentially arrested. So this is things people have told me. Um, I'm not making this as a factual statement. Um, whereas access is challenging, interview has also praised the role of Bakur Kurdish media in the Syrian conflict. Syrian Kurds were relatively pacified prior to the war and there was no large media presence, however. When people were prohibited to broadcast, this encouraged activism, and the Bakr media played a really big role in recording this, and recording what was happening in Rojava and reporting the day-by-day -day <coughs> events. <coughs> According to the narrative written by the media, the main aim is democracy, and the main concerns are safety and control. <coughs> and the people we interviewed, they don't describe Kurdish people as being politicized by the media, but they say <coughs> that the media reflects what they think. So, this is the main reason I made a PowerPoint presentation, is this graph here. Uh, to build our narrative of the war in C Syria through these media, we compiled our own literature analysis. Um, sources included uh, articles in English, in Kurdish, and Turkish, um, by biased papers, uh, by papers of claim to be biased. <coughs> there were opinion pieces um, and more factual pieces, I think. About 15 to 20 percent were opinion pieces included in this, and we had about 100 articles in total covering the period from July 15 until October 15 of this year. Um, the most popular topics, uh, so I should say first, what we did in all these papers that we searched online, we just entered the search word Syria in whichever language we were searching in. Uh, the most popular topics that came up were cities such as Mosul and Aleppo, nationalism, uh, women's rights, humanitarian affairs, um, and possible solutions for the conflict in Syria. Uh, by some distance, the primary topic was foreign involvement, uh, with particular emphasis on Turkey. And 
the category I just sort of called other included uh, topics on other cities like Hama and Homs and Idlib and when IAS was attacking in Afghanistan. Um, unbiased sources reported on movements on the ground, um, such as the placement of explosives in Mosul and bombings in Aleppo. They provide aerial views of the destruction and overviews of recent clashes. Opinion pieces reflected, for example, that the Mosul operation was being launched prematurely, or that they wanted foreign support, or in contrast, that they didn't want foreign support, they didn't want Turkish involvement. Uh, many voices <coughs> voiced that stability for Mosul requires a political solution, including comments on uh, Sunni population and operations of the Peshmerga. Um, media cited Aleppo as the epicenter of the Syrian conflict, with Assad using it as an example of his strength. Um, and reports on foreign involvement, such as that of Britain, are concerned mainly with military support, um, sometimes, uh, for example, that it could be pro-Russian. Uh, so, for comparison, we also had a look at uh, newspapers in the UK, and I think Germany is an example, because I'm living there at the moment, so I was really up to date on what was going on in the news. Uh, we just looked at which are the five largest newspapers by number of subscriptions <coughs> in the UK, that was the Guardian, the Telegraph, the Daily Mail, the Mirror and the Sun. And in Germany, uh, Bild, Süddeutsche Zeitung, Frankfurt der Allgemeine Zeitung, Die Welt and Handelsblatt. And they actually both also had very different narratives, um, but you can group them into, you've got the Kurdish narrative and then the one from Europe anyway. The British newspapers place most emphasis on developments in Mosul and Aleppo, also again when searching Syria for these newspapers. Uh, migration issues, uh, Russian and Turkish involvement, humanitarian aid, and at the moment also the possible effects of the outcome of the US elections. Um, however, <coughs> coverage of, for example, The Guardian differs a lot from tabloid newspapers like the Daily Mail. Um, which in the UK is a much bigger contrast than it's in a lot of other European countries. Um, so The Guardian will focus on political developments, while uh, the Daily Mail offers really graphic <coughs> overviews of atrocities committed by IS. They focus on uh, violent episodes caused by refugees um, in their host countries and violence towards children. They link to really shocking images and videos. Um, when we searched for Rojava on the sun, it had two hits for the entire online archive, both articles talking about the British volunteer who died fighting alongside Kurdish forces. Um, on the mirror, we had 19 hits um, for Rojava. For uh, The Guardian, we had a lot more, and it was a lot more balanced on um, humanitarian issues and solutions to the conflict, but their archive was really difficult to search, and it doesn't go back beyond 2015. So. Uh, it, it looks to me like they have very regular coverage, but I can't tell for sure. Then the Telegraph and the Daily Mail don't have search functions, but if you search for <coughs> Rojava plus Daily Mail on Google or the Telegraph, uh, we got at most three hits dating to 2016-15. Um, the only paper with any hits for Bakur was The Guardian. Um, and when you search Daily Mail and Telegraph Ansford for Rojava or Bakur, they have nothing, um, presumably because of the expected knowledge and interest of their audience. Um, when we searched the keyword Syria and Germany, um, the most prominent topics were foreign involvement, uh, with heavy emphasis on Russia and Putin in this case, the threat of IS, the refugee crisis, um, with strong criticism of the EU, the situation in Aleppo and humanitarian aid. Um, when we searched for Rojava, we got a lot more hits than in UK newspapers, um, most of them dating between 2016 and 2014. So, whereas in the UK, most hits go back to 2015, in Germany they were 2014, <coughs> a few even for 2013. Um, and a lot of them, they would report on possibility or impossibility of an independent Kurdistan but also most of them mainly reported on events inside Germany, like pro-Kurdish um, protests, uh, Germans traveling to help IS, um, that sort of thing. Um, it is really noticeable that articles concerned with the Kurdish narrative of the war in Syria, uh, Rojava in particular, were extremely limited and published mainly during August. So even though we had hits going back a little bit more recently or further in the past, 
most of it dates to August, also not July, but August. Um, and most papers didn't begin to report on the whole situation until at least a year or two years after Rojava proposed um, autonomy. So um, there are regular factual reports on bombings and attacks, but topics such as human rights, culture, religion, <coughs> health, uh, and education, they're not absent, but they're definitely less prominent than in the back or articles. <coughs> so um, while this is a really brief survey of select sources, particularly when it comes to the Western newspapers. It's evident that British and German media rarely turned to Bafour as a source of information on this conflict. And as a result, the narrative of the war in Syria differs really strongly between Bafour and the West. Uh, media in Bafour, as well as the UK and Germany, are very interested in foreign involvement in the conflict in Syria, whereas Germany primarily worries about Russia, and Bafour's main concern is neither Turkey. Uh, of course, both of these perspectives are understandable just from a historical, geopolitical point of view. Excluding tabloids, the main difference in the narratives is European focus on refugees versus Kurdish interest in nationalism. European sources tend to summarize the situation in Syria as one in which many different factions are fighting one another, that this is chaotic, and that this is difficult to predict where it might go. While this is true, sources from Baku report more often on specific events and people and uh, with a particular interest in the Kurdish fight for autonomy. These are stories which provide a social cultural background to the Syrian conflict, encouraging insight and understanding. European sources also tend to focus on IS and Assad, providing a few details on other parties involved, but not many. Essentially, this simplifies the narrative to the point of misinforming the audience. Black or Kurdish media do not highlight the effects of the Syrian war in Europe or the rest of the world necessarily, but they present how the war affects the region and the inhabitants itself. Um, I think that's all I've got. And if we don't have enough time for questions now, uh, I have an appointment at one o'clock and I have another appointment at four o'clock, but in between then I'll be here. And if someone wants to have coffee or dinner, I'd love to talk about it as well. So I'm sorry if we don't get around to answering everything. Thank you very much. So we'll have questions for the last three speakers all at the end. And um, we move on now to Ariat Monkas, who is Associate Professor of Sociology at Gajah Mada University. She'll be speaking to us today on public morality and the transformation of Islamic media in Indonesia. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to present, this is actually an extended uh, work of my PhD thesis at Humboldt University of Berlin. It was supported by Berlin Graduate School Muslim Cultures and Society at Prague University in Berlin as well. <laughs> and, uh, well, uh, I begin with a question <coughs> of uh, what do Muslim, Indonesian Muslim mean by public morality? So uh, public morality uh, usually concerned with moral and ethical standard addressed to society. It's also uh, dealing with social pressure to uphold moral and ethical standards, forms of regulation, including disciplines, and often characterized by moral panics. So I would like to highlight the word moral panics, uh, perhaps uh, maybe later on. Uh, you have heard about what actually happened in uh, my capital city today that lots of the members of uh, Islamic defenders uh, they got uh, together uh, for uh, dealing with the march against the uh, Basuki Cahaya Purnama the major of Jakarta cities uh, so why I would like to highlight the, uh, the uh, issue of moral panics because uh, it is uh, usually uh, appears as the most uh, representation of the Islamic media in uh, contemporary Indonesia today. So <coughs> this is the Dawah media in recent Indonesian context. Uh, in general, it is not only about labeling Islam but also constructing Dawah. And they have particular historical roots in the colonial era uh, and the early independence. And 
uh, especially in the authoritarian regime or the order regime, than in post-authoritarian regime that we call reformasi or the reform era. Uh, I, I, I did actually a little kind of a, su a summary from my PhD work. There are some similarities in common in every Indonesian historical context that all uh, Dawa media seem to address issue of proper Islamic practices because uh, we con I, I consider that Indonesia has a different kind of is Islamization, okay, with the, I mean, like the uh, Arab, with the Ar Arab or any other uh, people who, who meet the, the Indonesian as a nation state, I mean, as a nation, uh, after the post-colonial era. And uh, all, all those uh, Dawa media seem to address issue of proper Islamic practice that <coughs> social justice and then the promotion of Islamic identities and question on multiculturalism and or pluralism. So, uh, however, uh, they do have difference in common, like the way they refer to proper or authentic Islamic practices and a sense of national identity. That is also a very kind of, uh, how would you say that, it's a very problematic until now because under the Sukarno period, for instance, there are lots of uh, the use of uh, authentic kind of uh, reference to proper Islamic practices. Uh, I, I would I would like to show you later on uh, about how to uh, address <coughs> Muslim sympathy uh, for a national character building. This is the example, like the Majalah. Uh, Pembela Islam or the Islamic Defender magazine uh, in uh, published first in 1930s and it was uh, under the influence of the uh, Salafi uh, network yeah the um, that also resembles the the teaching of Hassan Albana in Egypt that is that that was in the colonial era so this is the Dawa media in early independence uh, Majalah Persindo, for instance, this is uh, uh, they refer to kind of uh, proper Islamic practices that address issue of socialism, and then the other is Suara Muhammadiyah. Sorry, I, I I got that from Google actually because I lost uh, some data about the, the content of Suara Muhammadiyah, uh, and Suara Muhammadiyah uh, try to try to seek. Uh, how to say that uh, support from Muslims against the uh, Japanese uh, occupation in Indonesia, and they got uh, quite successful doing that until now. So Dawa Media in the Suharto era. That, that's from my PhD work uh, in Berlin. I took the uh, case study by comparing Umi and Amana. Uh, Umi is rooted in the Dawa movement or Tarbiyah movement that is uh, under influence of the Muslim Brotherhood uh, <coughs> since 1970s in Indonesia and they become they became uh, very much uh, famous in the most state leading campuses in Indonesia. Then I took also Amana. Amana is a popular uh, woman magazine. <coughs> So this is an example. So this is an example of uh, the cover of Amana, and she took this kind of uh, how would you say that? That's yeah, yeah. Uh, and that's an uh, excerpt from the Amana, a consultation column on family planning program that is very progressive actually at the time. At the time, it's very progressive. But this one is Umi. Umi circulated underground, so it is not. Uh, published openly in the 1990s. So, uh, is it uh, Seni Mendidik Manusia, the art of educate uh, human. And then this is the UMI editorial <coughs> suggestion for practicing polygamy and against uh, the government uh, program for family planning. So that's the transformation of UMI prior to 1998. <coughs> Uh, 
That's the main discourse. Zoza uh, Mutiyang <coughs> or being a loyal housewife. And this is, uh, I, I make this kind of, how would you say, it's a, com a comparative uh, analysis of their rhetoric and also their uh, visual content of the magazine. That's Umi. That's mixed man. It's not a lot. This is uh, just in early after the reform era. So in 2000, prior to the Bali bombings. That's the, uh, the transformation of UMI in 1999 until 2003. So the early time of reform. They changed the, their main discourse from Alzoza Mutia wa Karima to become just a faithful woman, Maratu Saliha. Uh, <coughs> but still, the uh, uh, previous discourse still appears on their subtemes. For instance, like the call for jihad, anti-Christianization, public morality against the widespread <coughs> uh, of pornography in Indonesian media and against porno axi. That's a it's a very difficult to uh, grasp the, the meaning of porno axi actually. It's very uh, it's problematic. It's a problematic uh, how would you say that term in, in but in Indonesia it was uh, advocated by <coughs> this uh, group of uh, people who who are disagree with kind of, uh, how would you say that, sexual, uh, uh, not, not only sexual, but also uh, erotic, uh, explicit, that is also uh, represent in the Indonesian traditional, uh, uh, in, in Indonesian tradition, sorry. That's what I mean. And this is uh, just an example and how uh, <coughs> Christianization targeted Muslim. So this is the transformation of UMI after the uh, September 11 and Bali bombings. That's the thesis of, uh, that's the main thesis of my PhD work. Uh, so they have changed. They have, uh, they have changed after the Bali bombing a lot. For instance, they no longer uh, they no longer emphasize jihad, yeah, uh, for with particular uh, violence uh, purpose, but then they change their uh, discourse by uh, saying that jihad duty for women is becoming an active educators. So then, uh, issue of uh, well-being in the family is becoming much more important. They also becoming. Uh, more active in building communities, especially with Tarbia communities, and then try to uh, how would you say that? Try to make this uh, community much more empowered, so they don't have to buy or consume anything provided by the capitalist so-called uh, industry. So they have their own market, they have their own meat, they have their own, you know, to, to subsidize themselves. I have to skip this one. So this is the conclusion of the transformation of UMI from my PhD work. Uh, popular culture is commonly applied for advertising Islamic identity. So piety as a source of moral base. And then second, women are the target of new emerging Muslim public sphere in Indonesia. And then response to issue of pluralism is perceived by strategies of managing ambiguities, those who consume the magazine. So that's the, the tricky way of UMI. So they try to find like a secular uh, market as well uh, by selling piety. But on the other hand, they uh, built their own uh, economic community for their, their own their, their own uh, tarbia uh, members. And then the, the fourth is respond to multiculturalism is managed by strategy of managing constituency, those who subscribe the magazine. <coughs> this is my working progress. Uh, I'm still working with this. Uh, at the Dawa Media in their form era, and then how they are now battling with uh, same like in the in uh, Arab countries. I think 
uh, competing with uh, the authentic reference to his story. So, for instance, like after the uh, after uh, President Joko Widodo is appointed, there are because he is, he also got lots of support from a so-called secular Muslim and non-Muslim for his constituency. That's why lots of other uh, magazine, Islamic magazine, becoming much more. Uh, how would you say that? It's, it's emerging now. It's developing, like this one, uh, Jejak Islam. Jejak Islam is trying to uh, claim their their roots with shari uh, Sharikat Islam. That is also under influence by the so-called uh, the Communist Party of Indonesia in uh, in the colonial time. So they try to formulate other new discourse about socialism and how women should active as a public educator, something like that. <coughs> On the other hand, this is the, the other kind of uh, <coughs> Islamic magazine that is very much uh, under influence by the Salafist teaching that still, uh, you know, uh, forbid the representation of uh, women in the magazine, like they don't allow women to uh, <coughs> expose themselves in the magazine, but they will allow women to post their political opinions in the magazine. So this is this is what actually happened in Indonesia today with the social media, like a battle. It's like a battle. Uh, for instance, like this one appears online. They, uh, his Butahrir Indonesia, they have their own channel, like a streaming TV that is also available on internet. But for some others, uh, internet pro provider, they have uh, difficulties in accessing the material actually. So that's why I'm questioning also about the how the media and information is also circulated in Indonesian uh, uh, public. This is the other, like from the uh, uh, the community called the from the NU called uh, Aswaja. Uh, that he suggested, he suggested the the community not to problematize the issue of anti-Christianization, but uh, well. On the other hand, they part of those member also gather, gather together to uh, go uh, for a march, uh, protesting the governor of Jakarta today. So uh, I found it's a kind of a joke, you know, like that. It's like another kind of uh, how would you say that is a, like a, a theater, yeah, a political theater by occupying the issue not only. <coughs> of uh, proper Islamic practices, but also about how do the Muslim work with multiculturalism and pluralism. Because in Indonesia, we don't have a particular uh, authentic history with, uh, with Islam. This one is, so this is uh, so-called, I don't know, this is conclusion or just uh, I just pose another question for my next project. Uh, this, this is a new challenge uh, for Indonesian Dawa media facing post-nationalism. Uh, I, I would like to uh, say what would be the challenge of, of Indonesian Dawa media if nationalism becoming more fading. And then second, new forms of media, online and offline communities because there are lots of research on online communities, but still lacking uh, research on offline communities. Uh, and then, how do people share their vision about Islam and their root identities in Indonesia, of especially Indonesian Muslim, and how they argue about being Indonesian or being cosmopolitan Muslim? 
And then the third, how does Indonesian contested history on particular themes, for instance like social justice, dealing with the uh, genocide in 1965 and also the human rights violation in 1998, that still the, the, co the combating claim still continues until today. And then cultural identities represent on the new Dawa media in, in, the, in, in the reform era. Thank you. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Um, so our last, our last paper of the session is Salma Mustafa Khalil, um, who is a uh, PhD student at the okay. University of Amsterdam, um, who will be speaking on fixing for the revolution and inquiring into the role of Egyptian fixers in foreign media coverage of the revolution between 2011 and 2014. So good afternoon. I. I think throughout today and yesterday we've heard a lot about media in general as organizations and as production of knowledge and the kinds of things we hear about and we've, all, we've also heard predominantly about Egypt and the situation there so I think I'll, I'll skip that part of my project and I'll go right ahead to what my research was about and I would like to talk about today is the particular actors that take role and whose prime responsibility is to actually bring out this knowledge to the world. and. In this particular context, I'm going to talk about foreign journalists in Egypt and the local fixers that they worked with in order to report on the revolution between 2011 and 2015. And it's a very big amount of time, so there are a lot of breaking points that unfortunately I don't think there will be enough time for me to cover all of them. But I will mainly start with talking about fixers and journalists as separate individuals and the roles and qualities and what put them in these positions. And then I will talk about the relationship and how they work together in order to bring out the news. And finally, how this relationship worked in the realm of the global media that we've been talking about today and how this brought out the representation of Egypt. <coughs> the reason why I was interested in this, and particularly in Egypt, is because when there has ever been talk about fixers, which has been mostly been an academic paper and not much in media, is that it's been focused mostly on war zones in Palestine, Afghanistan, Iraq, Sarajevo, places where there was war, where their fixers were in practically an innovation of journalists there in order to actually access the knowledge. But in Egypt, the situation was different because it was political unrest, there wasn't a particular war, but there were still some forms of violence and certain challenges that the journalists had to deal with. The starting point of that was that the situation in Egypt unraveled really quickly and agencies basically sent anyone they had or used anyone who was there and that gave the impression for the fixers and that was what that was their motivation is in starting to do this is that they were ill-informed they were unprepared and therefore anything that was coming out about Egypt was very disappointing for them because most of them were either activists or <coughs> people who wanted to become journalists and report about Egypt the journalists however who were there that I interviewed, they had a very um, confident perception of themselves. They were all between ages of 23, 26, 27. They saw themselves as very competitive. They were there to make a name for themselves and therefore they were really willing to work very hard. And they saw themselves as, we are perfectly qualified to do this. The fixers, on the other hand, had a variety of things to say. There were old kinds of experiences from fixers who worked with journalists who were indeed very well prepared, very professional, they knew exactly what they wanted, they knew exactly where they were, and all the way to journalists who basically went there, found a fixer, I'll pay you, finish this. And then they went off and got drunk and did whatever they actually really wanted to do mm -hmm. in Egypt, or basically see Egypt. The fixers, on the other hand, there was really consensus on what makes a fixer. You can talk about good fixers and bad fixers, but what really makes you a fixer is pretty much the same, is that you speak both languages fluently, you are, it's more about personality traits, so they have to be witty, they have to be well informed, they have to be very active, even proactive, and they have to be very, very knowledgeable, not just about the political situation and the security conditions, but also about the geography of things, the social conditions of the different issues that they were reporting on and the geographical conditions because some people were reporting on Sinai for instance and 
they had to be from there, and they had to be, speak the different dialects there, and they had to know the different tribes and the different relationship between these tribes and the Egyptian state, at a given time, even. Um, and their jobs mainly included explaining contexts to journalists, mainly parachutists who were just there for a few days. This is what's happening. Find sources. This is what we're going to tell. Inter do interviews. Make sure permits are there. And usually their job would be done in a few days. In terms of backgrounds, however, in terms of formal qualifications, they didn't really have pretty much anything in common. I interviewed a civil engineer, a doctor, a teacher, a DJ, a bunch of unemployed people, <laughs> you know, any, anyone who spoke the language really and was willing to do the job would do it. The only thing they had to have was being activists or aspiring journalists. Now moving on to the relationship between them, we can talk a lot about the different power dynamics that could play in there. But the situation in Egypt was quite different because ideally a foreign journalist would go into a country, if a parachutist or a freelancer or even a beginning foreign correspondent, they would build their network, they would jump into the already existing journalist community there, and from there they would get their fact checks, their fixers even, recommendations for issues to cover. But in Egypt it was slightly different than that because then protests go, I don't know anyone, and before that not much has been happening, so a lot of people had already left, so they went there, they jumped into the protests, and whoever they found and could help them, that became their fixer. <coughs> that then led to a very bumpy beginning for the entire landscape of fixing in Egypt, but then eventually people started finding the wrong ones, the, the, right, the right fixers and the wrong fixers recommending to each other, and then we move on to trust. And trust really had to go both ways in this situation because we're not talking about war. It's not as simple as, don't get me killed. Mm -hmm. it's, it's pretty much, I, is he giving me the right information? Is the journalist actually going to pay me? What is actually going to come? I'm going to give you this information, this access to people. What kind of story are you going to tell? There were instances where fixers blatantly lied to journalists, told them, oh no, this is not happening, this is not true, that person is not available whether that was for laziness or political agenda or whatever other reasons, there were also incidents where the journalists either lied about the purpose for being there, they took the information and they wrote it out in an entirely false outcome, or they just stole the fixer's work. They'd send them out to places that are very dangerous in, in protests or shooting to get pictures, and their name, not the fixer's name, would be on the recognition. But also there are other things that were at play here because we're talking about political unrest. So it wasn't simply about the fixer and the journalist. There were also the political people and the political entities that we've mentioned once and again, where, for instance, one of the fixers, Hisham, a couple of incidents happened particular to him, which I find interesting that it happened to him twice, not once, is that he had an interview with one of the political figures of the Brotherhood, Hayat Shultir, and once it was actually published, his political uh, representative's office called the magazine and said what was published was not true, um, the fixer lied, the fixer mistranslated, we are going to publish a statement to say that you lied. And at first, the agency and the journalist very much defended the fixer, like, no, it's not, it's not a lie, we really trust our fixer, really trust this translation, and we're going, and it's gonna stay the way it is. The office then published an accusation <coughs> in the magazine that they have lied about us, to which the magazine responded, okay, now we really need to check it if they are that sure. They brought on other translators <coughs> and other translators to hear the recording once and again, and once they made sure, they lifted up the phone, if you do not retract and apologize, we are going to publish the recording, to which they knew there was much worse than whatever actually came mm -hmm. in that report, and they did pull it out and they did apologize. Another incident, for instance, which would affect a, a fixer on the long run is that they're all reporting on the same things, and if one fixer has access to a particular figure, usually journalists go to him, because, well, he already knows that person, he can get us to him, it's guaranteed. So one of, one of the uh, media people, actually, he was interviewed by one of the fixers, and when he did not like what was said about him, he refused to do any other interviews with that fixer, and that kind of really reduced his chances at certain kinds of work because at that time fixers depended, this was their source of living. 
And this was a very big problem for that fixer because also people talk to each other. If that media person says he lied about me, the chances are no one else will talk to him, at least for a while. On the other hand, um, oh sorry, there was also the case of fixers with special access, like for instance women. Fi women who decided to be fixers were always put in this particular zone of what kinds of things they'll get us access to, so women predominantly covered issues of harassment or from our tires when a journalist wanted to go into a house, he'd take a woman. And even interestingly, because especially in the cases of journalists that knew the culture well enough, they understood that if they were going to a place where there was political violence, where there might be a fight, they would take a fixer woman. Because understanding the Egyptian culture, oh, if there's a woman there, people are more likely to behave. Another situation, for instance, was Sinai, but then even more, um, which was, I think, mentioned earlier about the situation of Christians in Egypt. There was a fixer whose specialty was to go into Christian communities, like um, the garbage city in Cairo, and interview people there, take, take journalists there, um, interview for them, and even take part in the dialogue that the, that the journalists were trying to achieve by going with them into Muslim communities as a representative of this particular Christian community. Mm -hmm. So in that sense, fixers really used their position in society in order to get things going in terms of working and in terms of also representing Egypt in the way that they felt it needs to happen. But there were, it was also not always very smooth because there is a cultural gap. And as mentioned yesterday by, I think, Professor Daya, is that most of the journalists and this has been my experience, are either American or British. And there was a few exceptions of French for French media, but usually an American or a British would be also doing reports for Spanish media or German media or whatever it is that languages that they could speak. Um, in that sense, it was a very small community that had a particular culture and work ethic that's different from that of the Egyptian. The Westerners, there's this perception in Egypt, Westerners are very strict all on time, they know exactly what they want, and the Egyptians are very laid back. You know, 10 can be anywhere between 10 and 12. So they really struggled with, with that. And they mostly also struggled with the idea that most of these fixers were activists. And during the interviews that they were, they were conducting and translating, journalists had to repeatedly let them know that you're not supposed <coughs> to discuss things with the interviewee. You're not supposed to share your opinion. You're not supposed to debate. Your job here is to translate and period. Whatever happens next is a completely different story. But going back to the power dynamic, it's an issue of access here, right? They have to work in, in partnership. And that partnership meant more than the fixer has access to the street and the language and the community, and the journalist has access to the money, the publicity, and mm -hmm most importantly, the passport that will get them out of there if things turn south. And in that sense, they had to negotiate a lot and they had to discuss a lot what was, what was gonna come out of whatever they were working on. And they also had to discuss a lot how recognition was going to happen. Initially, I wanted to do this because I wanted to look at what kind of recognition do these fixers have? How much does the world or the readers actually know about them and the kind of effort, effort that they put in there? They're not acknowledged even as a profession. But when it comes to the ground, when it comes to what you're actually doing, when it's not a war zone, when it's political instability, things work very differently on the ground. And I went in there thinking that the fixers know these are people who want to be journalists, so they want their name. But there was general consensus that anything but my name on that work. It all, of course, it depended on what they were working on, but for most cases it was, and that was before and after uh, Rabah, after um, 2013, but of course much, much more after 2013. It's like anything but my name. They wanted to get paid and they wanted to keep getting paid. So if you're leaving now, recommend me to someone else, make sure that your organization knows about me so that if I get in trouble. But the closest thing anyone got to ensuring the safety of their fixer was that there was the foreign correspondent for the Guardian at that time, and the best deal he could get is that, well, if your fixer gets in trouble, depending on how bad it is, we'll send a lawyer. And that was pretty much it. 
And that moves us on to how this intricate relationship works in terms of the global market. How do the big organizations come in? And, and I've talked to a lot of people as well as did research about that. And we've also covered this about how the Egypt and the region is generally misrepresented in the media about how there's this Orientalism concept where we're seen as incapable of representing ourselves. And it was a question that came back and again. And then it also moved on to the lack of acknowledgement of the fixers. They're not even in always included in the journalist's budget. The journalist goes there and he has to take out of his own money to pay for that fixer almost 90% of the time. But what's even worse is that certain organizations have accused the journalist's work of being unauthentic and unreliable because they have to depend on a fixer. Which when you think about it, he doesn't speak Arabic. How else would he get that work? But then no, you depended on a fixer, so we're gonna have a tone of obscurity in your work because we can't say that concisely as a fact. Um, and that put a lot of stress on the relationship between the fixer and the journalist. The journalists would be working with the fixer for a year or two, and then suddenly one day it would go like, but are you sure about this? But should we really publish that? But um, is that not biased? And that would really make the fixer question, but why am I even doing this? What, where, where are these accusations coming from? I've been working very hard, and now I'm not even trusted for the most basic information that the journalist was standing there while we were acquiring. So not only did they have to align between themselves, given all the barriers that are between them and all the different perceptions of the world that they each have, they also then had to also align with the organization that they were reporting with, because otherwise they'd be writing reports and choosing issues that would never get published. And that would be a waste of time, money, and really, in cases of, of activist journalists, a lot of energy and, and motivation to actually keep working. So, but then, the sad thing is that this is where a fixer's role ends. This is where their agency stops. Once the journalist is in discussion with the organization, there is absolutely no place for a fixer in that discussion. Looking at the entire process of how things happened in Egypt, from beginning in the square, in the middle of a protest, where I don't have any option but to trust this person, who is the only person who speaks my language and who can get me out of here, not just give me information, and then moving along to one report after the other, going into dangerous places, to safe places, people's homes, sharing meals, spending light nights <coughs> traveling. Um, they really did become friends that didn't only depend on each other for work, but they shared their lives together because in certain conditions like in Rabaa, it was very bad, and because a lot of journalists and fixers have disappeared then and are still <laughs> accounted for until now. So having journalists bear this responsibility on themselves, understand that I am going there, I'm going to use this person, as, as in literally use him to get my job done, it required them to understand that what is this costing that person. And not all journalists also understood that. Not all journalists were aware of how bad it is, and a lot of them didn't really care. But it was also about the fixers. They were predominantly activists. They wanted to get the word out, but they weren't always very honest either. A lot of them worked for political parties. A lot of them had very particular agendas and really, really abused the fact that they were the journalists' eyes and ears and completely monopolized their opinions and they were the voice of that journalist. Repeatedly journalists, but mostly the more, more professional, more experienced ones, they kept saying that, no, it's my job as a journalist to figure out that I'm being tricked, to figure out that I'm being lied to, but in a context where you don't know anything, how aware can you really be? And in that sense, my initial question was, how much agency do these fixers have? How much does their voice actually come out in that work? And their voice comes out perhaps most of the time through the journalists 
voice through what gets written, even if their name is not on it. But that is also very limiting. It is a responsibility on both that luckily uh, in a lot of the cases that I have studied, they're both very aware of, but there are a lot of factors that are outside of these two people's hands, but there are a lot of, a lot of things that are still in their hands. And a lot of journalists and fixers have gotten out stories by fighting for them, even if the agencies didn't particularly want to publish them. And in that sense, the, the fixers do have an agency, and so do the journalists. And I believe that these are the kinds of relationships that we also need to focus on, as much as looking at the narrative that comes out in the end, and whose, whose words get published the most in terms of an organization. We're not looking, we're not always, re we're not really actually even reading The Guardian. We're reading Patrick Kingsley and Mano and how they've made that story. We're not always listening to CBS News. We're listening to Clarissa Ward and somebody who was with her while she filmed in her documentary in Sinai. We're listening to people. We're not just listening to agency. And maybe if we give these people, as opposed to the organization, more agency by being conscious, critical readers, the fixers and the journalists will get much more agency than whatever they're having now. Thank you. So thank you all very much indeed. Um, I'd like to open the floor to questions um, on the last three papers. <coughs> if you want to come in on anything, you can tell me. You had a question? Yeah. My question is to Zenobia. Um, is it a case study of the Kurdish media only in Turkey or in Iraqi side as well. This is the first part. Uh, the second part, when there have been closures in, on the Turkish side, uh, did it have any impact on the Kurdish sides of the Kurdistan, uh, Iraqi side of the Kurdistan? Because if you note the number of uh, Kurdish channels mushrooming on European television satellite Hotbird, uh, they are running in dozens now. So, does it uh, positively or uh, negatively impact on the situation that you were referring to? Uh, yeah, I realized as I finished that I should have really specified we only looked at the part of <coughs> Kurdistan inside Turkey um, and not the other uh, parts, particularly because the issue of censorship is so big there at the moment and Iraqi Kurdish media are more accessible. And then there is this movement where um, you see a lot of media coming from uh, Germany and Belgium and so forth, but then I can't uh, differentiate how, how direct the line of information is and where it's coming from. So what we wanted to do is specifically focus on reports coming from the area itself only in this case. But of course, these are interesting questions in general and something we could expand on much more. And I guess your report would also be referring to the audience size. Uh, how much audience size each outlet has. Yes, we were especially interested in finding out what people are actually reading because I can Google, oh, Kurdish media or Baku media, but I was interested especially in asking people, so what do you read? Where do you get your information? What does your grandmother read? And what do people have access to in the region itself? Thank you. Can I ask people to state their name and affiliation before their question? Um, Jennifer. So, Gianluca Parin, ASMC. Uh, my question is for Ali. Um, so, first of all, thank you for your presentation. And also, in your opening slide, you had the combination between the Panchasila and the, the pros of the House of York. So, you were really mixing the UK and Indonesia. Uh, but uh, my question, because you have you had a column um, on rhetoric, right? Um, and I'm actually interested in you know, the issue of terminology and how these Stawa media are actually putting forward um, like, in, like more and more terminology from Arabic into Bahasa Indonesia, which is something that we've already seen in Bahasa Merayu. And um, I think that in, in even in the examples that you showed, that comes across, but we don't seem to looking at it. So I was wondering if you could tell us a little bit more about this 
increase in terminology, especially in the last one that you showed, Fawaid, right? Mm -hmm. An Arabic speaker could read the entire magazine except for Gambar, which is the picture, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. So that kind of introduction of Arabic into Bahasa Indonesia, um, how was that particularly a strategy of Dawa um, publications and pub uh, Dawa media? And how is that, you know, impacted um, the general Bahasa? <coughs> Well, uh, first of all, actually, uh, say like that, uh, although the uh, more than, I think more than 95% uh, uh, Indonesian are Muslim, <coughs> but only few people uh, speak Arabic, right? That's the fact, that because of that fact, and during the uh, Suharto era, uh, skills of uh, comprehending Arabic is very much influential. So, for uh, for instance, like the the uh, authority to interpret a particular text. Okay, I, I'm actually not uh, very much. Uh, how would you say that I, I'm not an expert. In, in Arabic, I also I learned Arabic in Germany, <laughs> which is a bit funny actually. So my my friends, uh, for instance, make a jokes. Why you learn Arabic in in Germany? Oh my God, that is very, uh, you know, like uh, unblockly say like that. This people won't believe that because uh, I came from a, actually I have I came from a secular background, but then my family also. Uh, being Islamized because of this kind of historical direction, see? So, uh, during that period, particular uh, translation and how the Muslim uh, authorities in Indonesia prefer to particular kind of uh, terminology like dawah, it's very, imp it's very important as well. For instance, like, uh, in the Suharto period, the Dawa media only refers to <coughs> particular media <coughs> that is uh, managed by uh, some Islamic scholars who got <coughs> uh, or who can claim their authority for Islamic jurisprudence, for instance. But then it changed after the Reform era. Everybody can claim that they are. Uh, they, they have authority for claiming the word Dawah. So it's becoming much more the, uh, <coughs> this, uh, I mean like it's, it's no longer, it's no longer sacred. Okay, the sacrifice. Uh, sorry, the sacrifice. The, <laughs> sorry for my English. Sometimes I, I forget particular uh, terms as well. Like it's no longer sacred words. Okay, so the Dawa media now is no longer uh, means like a kind of particular Islamic media that try to compel non-Muslim to be Muslim because they are, they are also a very sensitive issue in Indonesian debates on our history because of the event of the uh, 90 after 30 uh, September 1965 for instance like uh, to to survive <coughs> to, for some Indonesian if you want to survive you have to uh, attach part to particular religion okay and then because of the uh, communist sympathizer or those people who were disadvantaged by the Suharto regime they they, be, they became sur surrendered, for instance, to Islam or to another religion, say like Christianity, okay? So that's why uh, under the Suharto period, this is a very tricky because say like uh, the Dewan Dawah Islam Indonesia or the, the Dawah uh, that, that is also actually under pressure by the Suharto or the military regime at the time, but they are also they were also got support from the Suharto regime to get lots of material teaching from the uh, uh, 
like say like from Egypt, the lots of uh, Muslim Brotherhood books were translated into Bahasa. So that's my generation uh, at the time we came to consume that idea in 1990s. So they, they also became the protester of Suharto's regime as well. So when we experience uh, this kind of new <laughs> democracy, say it like that, it's, it's another kind of uh, new challenge because other issue come up. Other issue come up because, for instance, like some of my uh, uh, informants during my uh, research for my PhD work, they, some of them, they didn't realize, they didn't notice that they, their parents actually came from like a, a secular Muslim background that were also perhaps uh, affiliated with the, 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 Mus the communist sympathizer. But they refused that, they refused that their history and then tried to uh, apply to kind of another a fantasy about <coughs> uh, be becoming cosmopolitan Muslim, okay? And that's, this is another kind of uh, new trend in Indonesia that some youth who, who are secular actually, and they came from middle class background, they got really upset with, with the way uh, the, the Muslim organization in Indonesia tried to educate uh, their, their, their members about how to become much more uh, tolerant as a Muslim. Uh, how to, we have to accept a degree of pluralism. Okay, so this another uh, middle class youth Indonesian try to hijack they try to hijack the term uh, that was uh, that that are uh, popularized by uh, previously known as the uh, so-called Muslim Brotherhood or Hizbut Tahrir or whatever they label as Salafis. Okay, and they make a joke about that. Like uh, they they try to make another kind of uh, meaning on it. They try to put another symbols on it. And that's also provoke, okay, that, that provoke these uh, Muslims. Because they said that, well, you can make joke about us because we uh, apply to these particular uh, identities now. But then why, why, why don't you look at yourself? Because you came from like, high middle class Indonesian and mm. you talk about so-called uh, internationalist socialist movement but see what you wear okay what you eat <laughs> and then what you do <coughs> so this is new kind of how would you say that's uh, I'm, I'm a, li a little bit sad actually because I'm also a teacher a university teacher see when I saw these young people they got <laughs> you know, uh, uh, fight to each other. For instance, like when they talk about a very sensitive issue in LGBT, for instance, in Indonesia, that also, uh, <coughs> that also addressed by another Islamic uh, media. Some Islamic, so-called Islamic media that occupy the, uh, the dawah, the uh, old fashioned dawah magazine, they they become very much active in promoting tolerance by saying that, well, perhaps according to the Sharia and according to so called uh, nowadays Indonesian norm, we cannot accept lesbianism or gay or whatever at public. But we have to see that in our culture, in our tradition, that other sex is also accepted, okay? <laughs> so it is also new phenomenon now in Indonesia. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so lots of <laughs> questions. I'll say the order first. <laughs> lady here, then Omar, then David, then gentleman at the back. So lady here, please. Uh, okay. Uh, I'm Sima Wallace from Indiana University. Uh, my question is to Alma. 
I was uh, really thinking about your question for very basic questions. How common is the phenomenon of fixers in journalism overall? And how does it compare to just a source? Um, do people have like a similar um, practices with just local sources, some of they on the regular and just the yeah. Um, well, generally speaking, fixer, fixers in general were more, mostly prevalent, at least until the Arab Spring, in war zones. So Afghanistan, a lot of work has been done in Afghanistan, Iraq, Palestine, and in the way that mostly fixers were related not just to the journalists, but also to the military people that were working for America, for instance. But in, in Egypt, the the difference between a fixer and an informant is that a fixer is your way to an informant. In that sense, a journalist would be coming to Egypt or Cairo for, say, four days to a week. So they were, would contact the fixer even sometimes once this kind of profession is kicked off. They would contact them even before going, <coughs> telling them this is what we want to report on. A fixer would find the sources, make the plan. The journalist would come, do the interviews, gather his data, and go. <coughs> And for the journalists who were there for a longer time, it became kind of a job. So a fixer's job would also include following up <coughs> on news, translating documents that keep coming up, um, watching the television to see what's being, what's being said on the popular media. So in that sense, they are, there ha it has been debated whether they are co-journalists or assistant journalists. <laughs> <laughs> Very quickly, do they actually ever say, I mean, uh, these, uh, I know they don't have to pick their names, but additional reporting by? Yes, in depending on the thing being reported on, they would say additional reporting by, or in a byline, a fixer would be mentioned, but very rarely ever in their actual name. Because you trace the journalist and you also trace their other work. Mm -hmm. um, I also wanted to, to follow up and ask you to contextualize more the idea that they their career uh, aspirations, that they don't want to actually be journalists. Can you talk more about basically um, their, let's say, socioeconomic background? <coughs> like, are they are they university <coughs> graduates? Because from from the from how you describe them, if they're bilingual, if they so they must come from a certain class. <coughs> like, how does the what is their <coughs> career aspirations and trajectory generally? Um, well, some of them did want to be journalists, and some of them did actually become journalists. <coughs> um, and in sense of the language, so again, most of them were, were middle class, but not always. There were a couple of, of lower class who actually <coughs> developed their English in order to be able to do that job. And um, I'm sorry, what was your third? Um, else? Like about their, their career trajectory, yeah, so their let's trajectory. say, like aspirations. Would they, do they have other jobs? Like the labor aspect, is it a part-time job? Is it a full-time job with prospects? Yeah. So between 2011 and 2013, it was a full-time job for most of them. A lot of them actually quit their jobs in order to be able to do that full-time. Um, in particular, and very common, it happened where there are people in tourism, which was completely killed in Egypt after 2011, so they all shifted towards that. Um, and some actually intentionally quit their jobs. There was the civil engineer and another uh, software developer. They both in quit their job in order to be able to do that. Um, others didn't have other options. Particularly, there was um, a woman who was a lawyer, and when she realized that as a woman in Egypt, she's not really ever going to be a lawyer. Mm -hmm. So she stopped that and became a fixer and eventually a journalist. So, but not all of them wanted to be journalists. Some of them were just activists. This was part of their activism. And once it was done, it was done. Okay, uh, David Harrison, um, Al Jazeera. Salma, I've worked in dozens and dozens of countries uh, with fixes. Um, and the best ones are worth their weight in gold. The worst ones could put you and have put me in life threatening situations. Mm -hmm. But I just wanted, from their point of view, from the ones that you spoke to, did you feel that any of them uh, felt they weren't getting the recognition or the appreciation that they merited? And, and if so, what? what kind of appreciation and recognition would they have liked? Well, a lot of the time, the journalists lied about whether fixers actually do get bylines or not. And a lot of the times, they could get bylines, but they didn't, because the journalists wanted only their names. Um, in certain cases, for instance, and I 
I don't feel at liberty to mention any organizations or any names really, but there were certain organizations that had offices in Cairo that would use the fixers that are used by these offices and just mention the office name, even though the people that actually work in the office didn't have anything to do with that. And there are other ways to mention that you you get help. No, that's in right. an article. What did they want? What they, did wanted, they, say to you? they wanted they wanted the recognition. They wanted to sustain themselves through that job. Yeah. So they wanted to keep getting more work, and that can only happen when a journalist uses their network mm -hmm. to get their fixer more work. And particularly for the activists one, mm -hmm. their biggest recognition was that mm -hmm. their message would come out, what actually happened would come out, that it does not get altered or changed or trimmed in any way by the organization, which was a fight that the journalists very often had to have. This was mostly the recognition that they wanted and not so much names, because this was affordable. Thank you. Gentlemen at the back. Okay, I'm Al Mustafa Minchawi. I'm a lecturer at the University of Westminster. And uh, I want to ask Omar, uh, thank you so much. Excellent uh, uh, research, insightful and original for me. My question to you, uh, do you think that, judging from the Foucauldian perspective that you offer them, uh, uh, just power relationship, discourse and counter discourse, do you think that the, with the destruction, physical destruction of ISIS happening right now, we will witness in the future uh, counter discourses by other ICs, if you like, different Islamist organizations that bring up this Islamic, glorified Islamic. <coughs> and secondly, as a researcher, judging by the coherence, repetition, frequency, and resonance of the frames and macro thematic construction that you have seen in your research, can we make a judgment that ISIS was a success story? in this discourse construction, regardless of how brutal and terrorist they are? Um, well, well, first I would say that, that obviously any particular perspective is, is limited because, you know, you're explaining a very complex phenomenon that is, you know, that uh, part of it is discursive, part of it is, is uh, performative, and part of it is about war and violence and who has access to guns and, and resources. So I don't want to be reductive in they're claiming that what I'm saying basically explains explains everything. Um, so I'm just I'm just maybe highlighting part of the picture that that I think needs to get more more attention and kind of switch the, the perspective from uh, from only thinking about um, interpretation of text from a normative uh, point of view. And so the the violence is is definitely is definitely something that. I think also needs to be really put in the forefront of uh, how to understand this phenomenon, but it's, it is not separate from the violence that they, they perpetrate on, let's say, an understanding of history, on physical monuments that they also erase and, uh, and destroy. So that, that kind of, uh, or like the, the spectacle of violence anyway, because that, that mm. happens within this framework, uh, within basically uh, in public squares and uh, that becomes an alternative way of basically uh, performing politics if, if you want so it's all it's all related and it's complicated and I was just trying to kind of uh, give one one uh, perspective on that and in terms of, of what can come after I it's that's a very very I don't know difficult difficult question and I would say that it comes down to to politics at, at the end what is happening? What is happening on the ground? Wha what are the developments? What is what is happening in, in the region? So it's um, I I don't feel comfortable really being specific here. Yeah, hi, uh, I'm Elena from the University of Sheffield. I have a question for Salma. So um, it's 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 a, it was a fascinating song, a talk and very informative. My question is: You talk about agency. Mm -hmm. So um, I'm wondering. Uh, like who decides, uh, decides what's newsworthy and what's not? Is it the journalist or the fixture? Um, like in terms of agents, do they have actually any say on what's news newsworthy or not? Especially when you talk about the long run uh, uh, journalists who are established in Egypt and the fixtures uh, work with them. Um, well, there were many layers of that really. On a certain level, there is the world news, there is what is deemed as newsworthy internationally, what the agencies would be willing to publish and what they would deem as not important. 
but you also have the different specialties of the journalists, what they would be looking for, and the specialties of the fixers that also comes in play. But um, there was also the issue that on the long run, journalists who stay for a long time get a tunnel vision. What is interesting, what would be interesting for the world outside would stop looking interesting to them. And, in, and that was one of the reasons that the agencies, most of them, stopped sending foreign-based correspondents. I only came across one, maybe two, in the few months that I was there. This was mostly an economic decision that it's cheaper to use freelancers or parachutists, but also because of that. Because you would send, like for instance, in the organization that was previously mentioned, they've been there for a while, their perception of what's interesting <coughs> has changed and what's newsworthy has changed. So they would send someone from the main office every now and then to take a look at the landscape to decide, oh, maybe you need to look at that, maybe you need to look at this. And it was, to a big extent, decided by the organization that would send or assign a job to the journalists. But a lot of the time, it also depended on the journalists' ability to pitch their stories. And this is more particular for freelancers how they present it to the organization, how they make it look like, and they can't quite develop this interesting angle without the fixer. So they did have, a lot of them had the, a way of leeway of how to present their stories in a way that would make them appeal to the views of the general organizations and hence the world news media. But it, it was a very big question, a very challenging one at that. Hope I answered your question. We have a few more minutes. Uh, yes, please. Yeah. Um, in that case, Sorry, could you state your name? Oh, my name. I'm Kimani Njogu from Nairobi, Kenya. Um, in that case, to what extent does the fixer fix the story? Because um, is it possible <coughs> that the fixer uh, guides the story mm -hmm. in a singular way? depending on their own persuasion, mm -hmm. and robs the possibility of diversity of voice, mm -hmm. uh, which would naturally come if the journalist um, was not aligned, in a sense, to, to, to the fixer. I mean, I, I don't know whether that, 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 that's something that you might have come across. It, is it was definitely possible, and it was a danger that they were both conscious of. Some used it, some didn't. That the fic the journalist, the less experienced, the more likely could be completely guided by their fixer. But <coughs> that there there were safety nets for that, in a sense that journalists in Egypt, and particularly at the time that I was doing my research, which was shortly after Rabah and journalists were disappearing and Al Jazeera trial was taking place, everyone was very very careful. So they fact checked everything. And if we're talking about the general discourse of the politics in Egypt many journalists would be reporting on the same thing at the same time. So if a journalist would repeatedly bring out something that looked too different from the others, they are less likely to think that they're special and they're more likely to think that they've been deceived. So <coughs> particularly when talking on the long run, this is what they would use and because this has happened repeatedly and because journalists reporting on Egypt are tightening into community, after a while, journalists stopped just hiring fixers. They would go back to the other journalists and making sure that, is this trustworthy, is he okay, listen to multiple testimonies, and then decide <coughs> to work with that fixer. So after a while, yes, they did manage to find ways to work around that. And, and uh, just to clarify, a lot of the times, it wasn't because a fixer had a, a linear view of things or a particular perspective. Sometimes they intentionally use the journalists and experience in order to get a particular perspective out. And that is more particularly to the Muslim Brotherhood and the Salafis, to be specific. A lot of fixers have done that intentionally, nonetheless. Yeah, one last question. Jakob Skorov, you listen from the University of Copenhagen. You mentioned the moral panics, uh, yeah. but left the subject again. Could you mention, say, two recent moral panics and whether Islamic uh, media, Dawa media, were instrumental in making them nationwide <coughs> moral panics, or are they mainly responding to what is already a moral panic? Well, <coughs> first, uh, this, I, I, I think I can 
uh, identified that uh, there are at least three other types of moral panics. Okay, the first is moral panic uh, <coughs> inherited from the past, like from you know from the past oppression, like from the a new order era that that is dealing with the. Uh, differences with uh, cultural identity with like it still happen like issue with mixed marriage issue with uh, against uh, uh, Christian uh, mission although it is addressed for humanitarian uh, helps but it is uh, sent to particular uh, the most uh, Muslim denomination for instance like what happened in like the region who got hit by the tsunami in Aceh, okay? That's all moral panics that was inherited from the past, dealing with kind of uh, uh, issue of pluralism, I guess. And then the second moral panics is uh, created by uh, the major media in Indonesia that deals with issue of fundamentalism uh, the representation of bad Muslim in the Western media, they become also another kind of moral panics. Okay. On the other hand, issue of moral panics also uh, trigger by uh, the the fact that uh, this new uh, government uh, is uh, was elected by mostly uh, people who believe that. Oh, he, he 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 came from non-military background, okay. So more panic caused <coughs> by instable uh, politics and how those uh, source for political support for the <coughs> government and the way the government, uh, I mean uh, President Joko Widodo, uh, for instance, try <coughs> to uh, uh, try to uh, <coughs> conduct his. Uh, previous promises, for instance, like dealing with the past reconciliation for human rights, and that's becoming another kind of moral panic as well. Okay, because lots of uh, the more the so called survivor or victims of human rights try to uh, put their claims of truth on the media, the more resistance came from the other side. Okay. On the other hand, they have also tried to deal with other issue of uh, social injustice as well. Because, for instance, like those people who subscribe to uh, the idea of Islamic uh, radical Islam that support violence, they came from a very, uh, you know, like classes, <coughs> and then that become another issue when it put on the media as well because oh that's becoming another project uh, will be uh, brought by the leading Indonesian Muslim organization to get more funding so then Indonesia will have more debt for uh, uh, you know what I mean that kind of issue that, that is circulated and, be, and make all those moral panics much more complicated than before. Thank you. I hope that I, I <laughs> answered that. <laughs> Thank you. A time for one very, very short question. Uh, uh, only a question uh, for Mr. Omar about the state and uh, nation. Uh, what do you think about the best kind of state for Arab world? Thinking or thinking about that the Arab map today is uh, British mark, right? and uh, uh, it's very important to uh, connect the state with nation. Arab people, I think, uh, the most of them like a big Arab nation, because uh, 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 what do you think about this question? Um, I, thi I think uh, it is important to uh, to basic to 
let me say it this way. I think that there is a, there is a crisis in the Arab world of basically relating nation states to a transnational, to transnational political discourse. And in, in my work and in this project, project in general, I also think of the role of media, transnational media, and the tensions between that and, and uh, basically nation, nation states. So you, if you think of the Arab Spring, for example, um, how it's very clear that the, that, that <coughs> resonated across states in the sense that the same political language, the same slogans, were transmitted from one country to another and there was a shared political symbolism. On the other hand, it was also clear that in each, the, that in each country there are specific conditions and political conditions, security conditions, and there's a tension between the re reconciling, basically, transnational media system and the transnational language and shared cultural repertoire with nation state systems of governance. Um, and, and I think we can uh, relate the, the issue of, of IS with that basically tensions between a failure of the nation state and between re regional ideas, whether about religion or uh, politics, um, so it is a symptom of that crisis, and its propaganda uses that these, these tensions um, effectively, I think, to, to present itself as some kind of a, of a model or a solution or, or whatever. Thank you. So, ladies and gentlemen, thank you very much for joining us for this panel. And, and thank you. <laughs>